I see Nasser is here. Nasser, welcome. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon to you. Hi. Good morning to you, sir. Good to see you again. Yes, How's it going? Um, and really nice to see you. Um, Likewise. Thank you so much for taking out the time uh, to speak to all of us. Uh, there's an excited bunch of people who have registered. Uh, being late Latifs, there'll be people joining <laughs> along the way, I'm sure. Uh, but, um, you know, I know I'm aware of the fact that you are um, packed with meetings as usual. So, um, um, you know, I think we should make a start. Uh, so, uh, Professor Nasser Rajput, uh, you know, a wonderful friend of mine from Warwick. Uh, and really, uh, you know, one of those people that uh, I really enjoyed having interactions with while I was there. Uh, you know, I, I said this in my post on LinkedIn that he's a wonderful human being as well as being just a, a very good researcher. And I'm so glad that he's had uh, an opportunity to take the time out and come and speak to us. Uh, Nasser Saab, I'm sure they're all here to hear you rather than me. So uh, without much ado, uh, I'll pass it on to you if you want to share your screen and uh, take over the mic. That'd be great. Sure. So let me see. Can you see my screen? Yes, lovely. Which one? Are you seeing the right one? With the it says AI for cancer diagnostics and that has the NHS, uh, university hospitals, and so on. on it in tissue image okay. and this is flat. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure uh, speaking to you and your colleagues, your friends, your students, uh, uh, your interns. Um, I'm Nasir Rajput. Uh, I am a professor of computational pathology at the computer science department, University of Warwick. Uh, I have also uh, uh, the honor of uh, having the Wolfson Fellowship from the Royal Society and the Turing Fellowship from the Alan Turing Institute in London. And I also have a joint affiliation with the Department of Pathology at our local hospital, the University Hospital Coventry in Warwickshire. <clears throat> Before I jump in, just a little bit of introduction. My background, I'm a computer scientist by training. Uh, I have a, a background in image processing um, in particular. That was uh, uh, my area of PhD. And um, uh, since about 2003, uh, for the last 17 years or so, I've been working um, on pathology images in particular. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what those images look like and what is the role of uh, analyzing those images for cancer diagnostics and prognostics. Um, just a little bit more in the way of background. Um, I come from the city of Multan in Pakistan. That's the other side of Punjab. Um, and whenever I mention Multan to my friends in India, uh, the first thing they say is, oh, that's where um, Sehwag made that triple century. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, a great way to remember um, this very ancient town of mine, um, which I still have a lot of affinity with, of course. Um, and it was a, a great feat of uh, a really high class test batting. Um, I'm gonna leave it there. Um, so it's customary in our field to um, give our disclosures at the start of the talk. Uh, so for me, um, I currently have uh, Philips Healthcare co-funding one of my PhD students. They are also uh, co-funding the Path Lake Center of Excellence that I'll talk a little bit about towards the end. Um, I've had uh, Intel Health and Life Sciences uh, uh, Department in London funding a PhD student, which is ongoing. Philips Healthcare co-funding another PhD student. Um, I've done consultancy for Merck, Pharma, um, and previously I've had funding from GE Healthcare Anonymous. Just a little bit about um, uh, computer science department at Warwick. Uh, this is what uh, Sarab, you may remember uh, from your days at Warwick, uh, the beautiful lake outside um, and the uh, nice building uh, on the side. So this here is the computer science department. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Um, and uh, Warwick is um, actually, the University of Warwick is based in the city of Coventry, which is part of the Warwickshire County that is famous for this chap here, 
that some of you may recognize is Shakespeare. Um, the computer science department at Warwick is currently ranked um, uh, second uh, in this uh, uh, research excellence framework. Uh, the last exercise uh, in 2014 that ranked UK based institutes by their subjects. All right, that's uh, all about the introduction. Let's jump in. Um, pathologists, uh, these are uh, expert clinicians who uh, diagnose cancer based on the visual examination of uh, tissue slides uh, that are taken out of uh, a patient's body, a patient who may be suspected of having cancer or somebody who's already known to have a tumor. And we want to do a bit more detailed analysis on that tumor. Pathologists um, are acutely in shortage across the world. And this is a report that came out um, about a couple of years ago, a survey by the Royal College of Pathologists, which found that only 3% of the NHS histopathology departments uh, said that they had enough staff. So 97% of histopathology departments in the UK uh, back in 2018 were running short of staff. Histopathologists, once again, are doctors and scientists who diagnose and study disease, um, tissue level diseases and, and blood cancers, blood disorders, um, and, and um, uh, the ultimate word on uh, cancer diagnosis. That's the I'm hearing a lot of background noise from somebody. Uh, okay, no, it's okay. Um, but even in countries like China, uh, there is uh, one pathologist per 130,000 population. And it is said that uh, China needs at least 70,000 more pathologists to make up the shortage of uh, uh, pathologists in that country to get up to the level of UK and US, which are already short of pathologists. The reason being that pathology is uh, a kind of an art, um, but also because the pathology practice is still based on very olden kind of technology. Just to take you over the process of how cancer is generally diagnosed, um, the definitive diagnosis of cancer, how that's made, usually what happens is that if a patient is suspected of having cancer, you would have a biopsy taken out of the patient um, and that biopsy will then be embedded um, in paraffin uh, and uh, sent to the pathology lab where they would cut thin sections from that. The sections would be placed on top of slide, mounted on the slide. The slide will be stained with appropriate kind of dyes and then is sent to the pathology lab for a histopathologist to examine. This is what the typical uh, office of a histopathologist looks like. You see these trays um, that have uh, glass slides mounted on them uh, and, and they are looked at by a pathologist one by one under the microscope, uh, which is um, something like this. And they then make a di diagnosis of uh, whether it's disease or not, if it's disease, it's cancer or not, and if it's cancer, what grade of cancer it is. Um, and I really like this quote from uh, John Herschel, um, who was an anthropo anthropologist um, who said, word are to the anthropologist, what role pebbles are to the geologist, uh, the battered relics of the past ages, often containing within them indelible records capable of uh, intelligent interpretation. And that's relevant here because that's kind of what the pathologists are doing uh, by looking down the microscope, it's a scene of a wreck. And they are trying to understand from that scene of the wreck, from that battered relic of the past, uh, what the patient might have been through and how the future might look like. Um, and this is a quotation from uh, a really fantastic book, The Emperor of All Maladies on Cancer by a young oncologist by the name of Siddharth Mukherjee, uh, who is currently practicing in New York uh, it's an absolutely fantastic book. I would highly recommend reading it if you're interested in reading a history of how various types of uh, uh, mechanisms um, over the past have been devised for treating cancer, for diagnosing cancer. Uh, and here he says um, that this uh, insight of uh, uh, treating uh, the, these uh, uh, samples from uh, cancer patients as um, uh, a scientist um, could understand the, the present and the future 
by examining those samples, uh, by examining those battered relics of the past, uh, was significantly important, I think, for not only understanding the past and the present, but also to understand the future. So uh, pathology is um, uh, at the moment going through a kind of revolution and the revolution is what's called the digital pathology. And it's enabled by uh, the recent advances in the technologies for scanning those glass slides that I was showing you a few slides earlier um, in this digital slide scanner, which takes in a whole bunch of slides and scans them and produces uh, an image like that. So this is uh, a typical image uh, of uh, a tissue slide, uh, which is typically 25 millimeter by 75 millimeters. It scans that slide um, generally at the resolution of 250 nanometers per pixel and generates a gigantic image, which is um, anything from 50,000 by 50,000 pixels to 200,000 by 200,000 pixels in one image. Um, and this is the, ch the change in practice now. Uh, this is our local pathology department. My colleague, Dr. David Sneed, uh, who is also a practicing pathologist um, and, and leading on the Pathlake Lake project that I'll tell, about, tell you about a little bit later. Um, and now he's not uh, looking down the microscope. The microscope is getting out of the view. As you can see, it's being pushed more and more to the side, but now he's looking at uh, these images on his screen and making his diagnostics uh, based on what he sees in that image. Um, and in our hospital in Coventry, we were the first ones in the world, in fact, to conduct the uh, largest validation study of digital pathology imaging to prove that digital pathology is, uh, it's non-inferior to uh, slide-based diagnostics under the microscope. And what that means is that we can now look at images like this. It's a bit like a Google Earth image starting all the way from very top level, uh, from uh, you know, country level or continent level and going all the way down to uh, regions and, and uh, cities and then villages and, and uh, small streets. And if I may just pause at this uh, bottom level uh, around here, uh, here you're actually seeing a very small, tiny part of the entire image. And in this uh, uh, really, really tiny part of the entire image, you can actually see quite a lot of action going on. Uh, so a lot of these cells, they are tumor cells. Uh, you see that their DNA has been broken up and the, the chromatin has been broken up because of the mutations in the DNA. Um, they are uh, really fuzzy in their shape. They are very variable. They're much bigger than usual nuclei. So this, this is a normal immune cell. Uh, this one is a tumor cell and you see they come in all shapes, guises and forms, basically um, messing up the morphology and the architecture of the tissue uh, in the patient. So what can we do with this data? Well, from my point of view, I'm an imaging scientist. Uh, you may call, uh, call it image data scientist. These are billions of pixels in every single image, and we now have access to hundreds of thousands of images like that with clinical data associated with those images. And what I see here is lots and lots of really interesting patterns, interesting objects here that I could recognize, and I could then build up a story uh, from bottom up, starting from the nuclei level, from cellular level, connecting those dots, and then building a picture of what might be happening at the patient level and at the cohort level to then try and predict the course of cancer. And that's really uh, timely because of the recent advances in computer vision and deep learning, where we have now uh, a lot of uh, really exciting uh, deep learning algorithms uh, based on large data sets that have been collected. Uh, this is a, a little old now, but still relevant. The ImageNet database, which was really uh, the uh, catalyst behind the development of convolutional neural networks and deep learning algorithms. Uh, now it's reached to the, um, to, to the level of uh, 15 million images that are organized according to WordNet hierarchy uh, with uh, thousand, just over thousand object categories. And in case you don't know what a convolutional neural network is, uh, it's made up of several layers of artificial uh, uh, neurons where each neuron is a convolutional block. 
And uh, that convolutional block takes in either a whole image or a small part of the image and um, takes a dot product of that image contents with um, some weights that have been learned um, by training process. And you can stack these layers up uh, one after another. Um, and it turns out that when you do that, uh, the, the first layer uh, operates on the raw pixels, but then the following layers operate on increasingly complex features from that image. So for example, here you, you're looking at edges and, and various types of uh, directions of those edges. And then you go on to combine various types of edges um, into further uh, uh, visual features that could then be used in the final, for example, softmax layer to determine whether it's a, a cat or a dog, for instance. Um, and these algorithms have been extremely successful um, really in spurring the revolution in computer vision literature um, back in 2010 on that ImageNet data set, uh, the classification error was uh, 0.28 by the winning algorithm. And that has been brought down to 2% now um, in, back in 2017. Um, and, and there are some marginal improvements since then as well. And if you compare that to human level performance of image classification, uh, which is roughly around 5%, we've made significant advances uh, in the last five years or so. So that now we can really have a serious track on some of those clinical applications. Um, and that's really the focus of our uh, research in my group. So uh, I call this petascale computational pathology. We're still interested in studying disease, which is what pathology is all about. But now a new discipline is emerging in the space of pathology and at the intersection of pathology and computer science known as the computational pathology. Computational pathology is nothing but um, the study of algorithms and uh, uh, novel uh, methods for statistical analysis for um, investigating disease in, in tissue samples. Um, and now we're moving more and more towards petascale because um, if you look at every image, um, as I mentioned to you, 250 nanometers per pixel, uh, an average image of 100,000 by 3,000, 300,000 pixels, um, uncompressed, takes about 90 gigabytes. Um, and as I said, we now have access to hundreds of thousands of images like that. Um, so if you only have 100,000 images like that, uh, that's going to take about nine petabytes of raw pixel data for uh, analyzing all of those images. Um, and just to put things in perspective, each of those images um, is roughly about 85,000 85, times um, bigger than uh, a standard digital chest x-ray. So that presents us as a huge opportunity for AI algorithms for early diagnosis and personalized treatment. Um, now we have uh, uh, the digital data plus the deep learning algorithms and uh, more recently, uh, you know, increasingly more powerful and, and uh, cheaper uh, computing equipment, especially the GPU computing equipment so that we can now target early diagnosis of cancer and, and personalized treatment of cancer in a, a really aggressive manner. Um, before I talk about petascale computational pathology, I would like to spend a couple of minutes on kilo scale computational pathology. I'm sure everyone knows the difference between the number of zeros in kilo and peta. Um, and I think it's really important because um, I, I really like this quotation from Robert Heinlein, uh, a generation which ignores history has no past and no future. Uh, so let's look at a little bit of that history. Those of you who are familiar with image processing may have heard the name of Pruitt in Pruitt filters. Um, these are some of the most fundamental filters in image processing for uh, edge detection. Um, and back in 1965, about 55 years ago, Pruitt was working on similar kind of images that she found a way to digitize um, in the NIH when she was working there. Um, and one thing that's really interesting is that she was already working on those images for almost a decade and she mentioned this very interesting uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, elusive uh, uh, concept that mechanical perception of uh, microscopic images like that with a reliability that would inspire routine applications still eludes us. This was back in 1965. She was already thinking about uh, reliability levels that would 
uh, be applicable in routine practice. Uh, and I think that's quite remarkable uh, for a very, uh, person who was um, already thinking about such long time ahead, uh, even though you know we were really, uh, we didn't have the kind of uh, uh, technologies that we have at our disposal for storage, for scanning and for analysis purposes. Um, this is a paper that she later published in, in 1979 by the name of Crafts and Grammars for Histology. And in that she was already looking at really complicated representations of those images such as this. Um, and this is a representation of these images um, in, in terms of graphs. Um, and and uh, what you're seeing here is a Delaunay triangulation of uh, a number of different uh, fiber muscles in cat, which were stained with a particular chemical uh, that are shown here with three different uh, types of uh, geometric shapes. So you see circles, uh, you see squares, and you also see diamonds. And she uh, was able to recognize the three different types of uh, fibers and then put them together in, in terms of a graph and uh, uh, analyze that. Okay, so with that history and, and uh, with that introduction, I would like to jump in uh, and tell you a little bit about the kind of work that we have been doing in my lab, uh, tissue image analytics lab at Warwick, uh, where we uh, have developed algorithms for the entire uh, life cycle of these types of images, starting from pre-processing, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, um, to analysis, i.e. recognition, detection, segmentation, classification of various types of objects of interest in these images. To synthesis and biomarker analysis, I'm going to skip that, these two. Um, and, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the analytic side of things, bringing it all together for uh, uh, patient management, for making recommendations for patient management. So let's start with pre-processing. Any good data scientist should know that any type of data that you get, uh, there's always some issues to do with that data and you may need to normalize, uh, standardize, clean up the data. One of the problems that we face in computational pathology is the uh, appearance of these chemicals that the tissue has been stained with uh, that are exactly the same kind of nuclei, but they appear in very different colors. So for example, the tumor cells here they have a very different um, uh, hue as compared to the tumor cells around here. So these are more purplish, these are more pinkish. So the problem of stain normalization then is given a reference image that perhaps you developed your algorithms for already, um, now you have a new image, how do you uh, translate the uh, color distribution of the source image into the color distribution of the reference image so that you end up with an image that's been normalized to the same color space that the uh, reference images were from, perhaps the images that you trained your algorithms on. So we realized this was a, a problem in the area um, quite early on uh, and uh, together with colleagues at Leeds, we developed this algorithm uh, for stain normalization. The basic gist of the algorithm is that um, it does stain de deconvolution, so blind separation of uh, the uh, inherent signals within these images, which are really two main things. Um, the dark nuclei, which are um, stained by hematoxylin, uh, that, that stains them as blue usually, and the uh, pinkish uh, type of uh, color here that is stained by eosin usually stains to the cytoplasm. So we uh, use this blind color deconvolution, um, just using the Beer-Lambert law in optics, to separate the, uh, the contents, the hematoxylin and the eosin. So here you see all the dark blobs and here you see all the areas that contain the, the pink and then some background. So three channel deconvolution. Again, the same thing for the source image. Um, and then we collect some statistics and do a spline based mapping of those statistics of these channels to the statistics of uh, the target image so that we get the normalized stained channels that have their uh, uh, their statistics uh, more like the statistics of the source uh, of the target image, uh, excuse me. So uh, take those normalized state channels and then reconstruct them to an image that looks more like the target image in terms of its color appearance. And it seems to work pretty well. So here uh, you have the proof of concept. Uh, you have eight different images 
uh, from different labs that appear very different in their uh, color appearance for uh, nuclei and for the cytoplasm uh, before the stain normalization, and here is after the stain normalization. And you can see that it really manages to uh, bring together the color distribution of all these images into a single color space uh, by and large. Uh, we actually put all these um, uh, algorithms together and other existing algorithms that have been coming along into our stain normalization toolbox that is um, available for download from our lab software pages. Um, and uh, uh, we're now uh, converting it from MATLAB, which has become a bit of a, uh, uh, an ancient art already uh, into Python. Um, and we're about to release that uh, Python-based uh, toolbox for stain normalization as well. All right, so that's a little bit about pre-processing. Now I'll jump into analysis side of things. Um, we've developed several different algorithms for recognizing uh, objects at various levels in these images. Uh, so here you see an algorithm that recognizes different types of uh, nuclei in the entire image. Uh, in purple, you're seeing uh, all the normal nuclei. In red, all the uh, nuclei of uh, tumor cells. In green, nuclei of the immune system. Uh, and um, in blue, the, the nuclei that are dead. Um, so that's one type of algorithm. Then we've also recently developed another algorithm for segmentation of nuclei so that we can precisely calculate the different types of uh, features for uh, various types of nuclei. For example, the tumor nuclei, uh, what are the different types of shape features, the texture features for those nuclei, and then how they could perhaps inform uh, uh, or have a predictive value for uh, patient's prognosis. Um, just to say a little bit about the architecture of this network, HowerNet, what we call, it has um, the usual uh, uh, convolutional and residual blocks, but perhaps more in, most importantly, uh, the main contribution of this network is that it has three branches. One that uh, uh, predicts the segmentation mask for the entire uh, image, that is the input. The other that predicts the horizontal and the vertical maps, and that's why it's called the hover net. Um, and the third that predicts the different types of nuclei, so i.e. it gives colors to uh, the binary segmentation mask that is predicted by the first branch. Uh, and that uh, idea of having the ability to predict the horizontal edge map and the vertical edge map is really useful for separating neighboring nuclei as was shown in extensive experiments in the paper that was uh, uh, published in medical image analysis uh, in comparison to a whole bunch of other algorithms that are available out there uh, on three different data sets. And we actually put together a new data set by the name of concept, which is also available from our lab data set pages. You can go and download it. At that time, it was the largest available data set when we released it, um, 24,000 nuclei with segmentation masks and individual class labels for every single nucleus uh, in, those, in, in that data set. Uh, recently, we've also developed another algorithm for uh, segmenting nuclei by just clicking somewhere in the middle of, uh, or close to the middle of the nuclei for all different kinds of nuclei. Um, and we call it new click, uh, going from clicks in the nuclei to the boundaries of nuclei was originally presented at the Mikai Medical Imaging Conference in Shenzhen, China last year, uh, but recently, just a couple of weeks ago, it's been accepted in an extended version has been accepted in Medical Image Analysis Journal. Um, and the main idea here is that first you get the user to click on every individual nucleus, and from that you extract the patches. And then from those patches, you um, build inclusion maps and exclusion maps as auxiliary input to the inputs that have been collected already. And then you have an encoder decoder kind of framework that generates the prediction map for nuclei segments corresponding to those uh, clicks that uh, were already made by the user. So uh, without going into uh, too much details, we used uh, this framework to collect uh, uh, the largest data set that's available out there for uh, various kinds of nuclei for different kinds of cancers, 19 different types of cancers. 250,000 now, roughly uh, images, um, sorry, nuclei, 
for uh, uh, segmentation and classification. So you have the nuclei segmentation masks, as well as the classification label for every single nucleus in that data set. Um, and that was released towards the end of uh, last year. As I said, the paper has been recently published on this algorithm, but also recently we put out a paper on archive uh, on the pen data dataset itself. Um, we've extended it further in the uh, journal version where we have taken uh, not just the uh, clicks in the middle of the nuclei, but now if you draw a wiggle in the middle of, uh, or somewhere in the middle of a uh, larger object, we can uh, then blow that up into a segmentation of that object. So that's uh, uh, what you're seeing here are glands, these objects, these larger objects that you're seeing here are glands that have been segmented using this algorithm um, by taking these wiggles in the middle and blowing them up using an extended version of Nucleic, what we call Nucleic Plus. Um, and, and just to uh, stay on that topic of gland segmentation, here is another network that we uh, recently published in medical image analysis as well, uh, what we call the MildNet for minimal information loss dilation unit uh, uh, network for gland segmentation. Um, and the main idea of this network is that it's designed to counter the loss of information that occurs due to max pooling in your uh, generic type of uh, CNN. So that's our uh, mill unit, the minimal information loss unit that really uh, addresses that problem. And here is uh, again, the proof of concept for uh, the same algorithm. In fact, we ran extensive experiments. You can find details in this paper. Um, we show that it works uh, not only for non-cancerous areas, but also for cancerous areas where the shape of these glands is um, quite fuzzy and, and deformed and, and really messed up. Um, so now we are uh, exploring how we could use these results for uh, uh, further uh, predictive analytics of uh, uh, patient prognosis and outcome. Another related algorithm here is um, uh, what we call the FAPNet for feature attention block network. And the main idea here is that uh, we introduce these feature attention blocks in the feature space, uh, the deep feature space, uh, before we separate out the uh, two branches for output, one for prediction of vessel, uh, micro vessels, and the other for prediction of these micro nerves in these images. Um, and here is the proof of uh, uh, the pudding. You see the original image. And in fact, the, the nerve here is really difficult. The, the um, vessels, um, blood vessels, they're uh, relatively easy to segment because they are uh, crowded by the red blood cells in the middle but the, best, the, the nerves are really difficult to segment. Uh, so we showed that this algorithm actually works quite well for segmentation of uh, micro scale nerves. Okay, um, I'm gonna jump to, uh, from these basic algorithms to uh, one particular application. We are exploring uh, lots of applications. We have publications on colon cancer, lung cancer, and oral cancer, but I'm going to give uh, just one a uh, story here, tell you a little bit about oral cancer work that we've done recently. And that is in the context of personalized treatment. Uh, personalized treatment is important because uh, we know that chemotherapy is toxic. Uh, it's cytotoxic, it kills uh, cancer cells, but it also has the ability to kill a lot of normal cells, which causes a lot of grief, uh, harm to the patient and their quality of life. There is that toxicity, but there is also the financial toxicity. Chemotherapy is extremely expensive, and especially in countries like India and Pakistan, uh, uh, where the, the average uh, um, earning is not terribly high. Uh, this can be quite costly. This can mean people selling their uh, assets uh, for treatment purposes. And, and uh, even then the treatment may not be hugely successful. So the idea of personalized treatment is, can we find a treatment that is tailored towards a particular patient so that the patient can benefit from that the most um, in, in, by, by using retrospective data, historical data of uh, patients' images, their DNA, uh, their clinical outcomes based on the follow-up and uh, predict for a given new patient whether they're likely to benefit from one type of treatment or another kind of treatment. 
And this is really important, not just from pathologist's point of view, but also from oncologist's point of view, who are the people treating uh, cancer patients. And here is a quote that um, I picked up from the same book, uh, uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee's Emperor of All Maladies. Uh, he is a practicing oncologist and he is faced with this dilemma, just like my other oncologist colleagues that I'm working with on a daily basis. Um, they are faced with these dilemmas of whether to treat a patient or not, leave them alone for a little while, or treat them aggressively, or um, you know, treat them with one therapy or another therapy. Um, and, and this is a personal uh, quotation from his experience. He says that the stories of his patients haunted him, uh, the decisions that he made, uh, the, the stories consumed him and the decisions that he made haunted him, not being sure if a decision that he made and this is not just him. This is the story of almost every oncologist that I've worked with, not being, being sure about whether the decision that they have made is the right decision or not, uh, is a um, uh, you know, real dilemma that they're facing on a daily basis. And in that context, I would like to talk a little bit about our work on oral cancer. Um, and this is a work that we've done uh, together with the Shokut Khanam Hospital in Lahore. Uh, and uh, it's important uh, to bear in mind the differences between uh, the incidence and the mortality rates in the Western world, uh, which you're seeing now on your screen, uh, and the developing world. Uh, so if you look at, for example, South Central Asia, the difference between incidence and mortality is very small as compared to the difference between incidence and mortality uh, in the developed world. Uh, so diagnosis of cancer in the developing countries, unfortunately, is very much like a death sentence sooner or later. Um, and, and that's a situation that's really, um, you know, disappointing. And I think it needs to change. And people like us, we need to rise um, above the, uh, the kind of usual politics that goes on and come together to uh, address this kind of challenge. So here again, another really uh, startling statistic, um, rather a, a map of uh, uh, the top cancers. Uh, so if you look at the Western world, the top cancer uh, is prostate. Whereas in South Asia, Pakistan, India, the top cancer is oral cancer. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that. Uh, some of them, so in Pakistan is the highest incidence rate among cancers. Second highest mortality rate, very low five-year survival. Uh, every year, uh, 13,000 new cases. Uh, that, that's only in, in this hospital, 13,000 new cases that are brought. And, and due to, uh, this is mainly due to the use of smokeless tobacco and, and B2 quid chewing the, the saparis and, and uh, the beeries and so on. And there's in fact very little known about the key pathology signatures that can help us stratify patients into different subgroups uh, corresponding to the different outcomes. I'll tell you a little bit more about how we address this problem. So we address this problem by, um, we, we took data, we had a funded project with uh, the Shokut Khanam Hospital, founded by uh, the great cricketer Imran Khan, who is now the Prime Minister of Pakistan as well. Um, we we uh, had a project with them looking into the histological signatures that could be digitized, that could be automatically extracted uh, to deal with the, uh, the issue of uh, stratifying patients into different risk groups. Um, so we call this uh, digital signature the TIL abundance score. And just to say a little bit about the TIL abundance score, it is a measure, a statistical measure of the abundance of lymphocytes, which are a very specific kind of uh, uh, immune cells that have managed to infiltrate into the, the core of the tumor. So it's the good guys that have managed to infiltrate uh, in the middle of the army of the bad guys, so to speak. Uh, and if these good guys, we have the evidence that we can uh, uh, you know, uh, turn into numbers uh, that says that uh, the, the immune system is functioning and it's functioning well, then generally it's a good sign. So how do we go about uh, uh, extracting that measure? Well, first of all, it's the usual case of applying uh, a deep learning algorithm to separate out areas that contain the tumor uh, cells mostly and areas that contain the lymphocytes, the, the immune cells. Uh, so in red, you're seeing here 
uh, areas that contain the, uh, the uh, lymphocytes in green areas that contain the, the tumor cells. Okay, so here, seeing the same thing in more and more detail. And suffice it to say that the algorithm uh, does a pretty decent job of recognizing there are lots and lots of cells and where there are tumor cells. Uh, again, in a bit more detail. And now uh, you can also see that um, uh, with this ability of uh, recognizing the different types of areas, we could come up with a very simple statistic that tells us how co-localized uh, the tumor cells are with the immune cells. And if there is evidence that there is lots and lots of co-localization of tumor, tumor cells with the immune cells, that's generally a good sign. And we can turn that into a number that we call the till abundance score. So here you see again, um, areas that are highlighted in green, they are the tumor areas, red that are the immune areas. But here you see uh, lots of uh, immune cells have infiltrated into the, right into the middle of the tumor. And we can turn that into a hotspot that is the TIL, the tumor infiltrating lymphocyte hotspot. And we can show this as, as a pretty picture, but perhaps more importantly, we can also turn this into a number that can then be used to uh, predict uh, survival or at least investigate its uh, value for predicting uh, survival and predicting disease-free survival in particular, i.e. the patient, are they likely to recur within next one year, two year, three years, and so on. So we use these numbers and we showed that on that cohort from uh, the hospital in Lahore, we were able to separate the high risk patients from the low risk patients uh, with a very nice separation uh, that was statistically significant. Um, so that was a, a small pilot study. Now we are looking to expand this and we've already actually uh, done that on three different cohorts from uh, uh, different countries so that we can uh, show the value of this uh, uh, and, and uh, hopefully make um, inroads into the clinical applic applicability of this. Uh, so uh, if you find that a patient is more likely to be high risk uh, based on this score, then you can treat them more aggressively as compared to patients that are uh, not so likely to uh, uh, progress very quickly. Okay, just uh, 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 rounding up, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, a couple of petascale challenges. As I uh, mentioned, we're working in this space in the context of petascale computational pathology. And one of them is uh, nowadays, there is a lot of interest in end-to-end -end machine learning. Um, chuck a, a, an input in, get an output. Uh, I don't really care what happens in the middle. That's one way of going about it. The other is uh, what we are doing is bottom up, which is, uh, recognize objects of interest and then collect uh, statistics from those objects of interest uh, uh, from bottom up. Um, and then the other uh, is the idea of visual context and attention. Now these are quite large images to really uh, identify exactly where the signal is coming from that is contributing to the final prediction. That is important. Um, and, and the idea of uh, uh, context, of course, um, you know, in natural language, for example, you only look at a few words before or a few words after or, or, or both, and you can figure out you know, what the, um, the output should be. But here you have uh, quite a, a large context. So how do we tackle that problem? And then finally, um, you know, with the availability of these large scale cohorts and, and uh, lots and lots of data, do we uh, bring data to compute or compute to data? What's the best way of going about it? Um, I'm going to talk about just uh, uh, the, the first one very quickly, the end-to-end -end learning versus bottom-up learning. So again, the end-to-end -end learning uh, image in um, and, and prediction out, whether it's tumor or normal, for example, or good prognosis or bad prognosis. Um, and uh, the other approach is the bottom-up. As I mentioned, recognize various kinds of primitives, regions from the image patches, uh, and then generate local statistics, uh, integrate them into a uh, kind of slide level statistics, a slide level score or index uh, or signature that can then be used to uh, predict a diagnostic trait, for example, prognosis, outcome, response to a particular kind of therapy. Um, in terms of visual context, uh, this is also important uh, just to, for, for the interest of those who may not be familiar with uh, 
visual context very much. So here is a really good example. Um, this was a paper published by one of my former PhD students. Um, and you can see here that the more context you have, uh, the better picture you have of what's going on in the surrounding of that little image right in the middle of that larger image. Uh, and it's exactly the same in uh, our area of pathology imaging as well, where you may see two things that are completely different that may appear to be exactly the same, but it's only by looking at the surrounding context that you uh, make a, uh, a better prediction of exactly what it is that you're looking at. So in that context, we uh, recently published a paper on uh, context aware convolutional neural networks. Uh, and I don't have too much time to go into the details. So I'm just going to say, if you're interested, um, then uh, you can go to our uh, publications page and, and uh, you can read up on this paper. Um, the main idea is that we uh, stack up uh, these uh, uh, feature representations for these small areas into a feature cube, and then uh, using attention block and context blocks, we make the prediction of classification and segmentation rather than uh, basing those predictions on individual uh, little uh, areas of the larger image. Um, and that seems to work pretty well uh, for predicting uh, normal low grade and high grade in colorectal cancer. Um, and here again, you see that if you use the usual network, the mobile net are the usual way of stacking up uh, the predictions from your CNN, the features from the CNN into an LSTM. Uh, that doesn't work uh, as well as the, the idea that I just mentioned. Okay, I think I'm, I'm gonna skip the next few slides in the interest of time. I'm going to jump to Path Lake, which I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, it's a National Center of Excellence on AI in Pathology, uh, co-led by uh, our local hospital, Coventry, by my colleague, David Sneed, who is a clinical lead. Uh, and Warwick University where I am the PI and, and I'm leading the computational arm of this project. Um, it stands, Pathlake stands for Pathology Image Data Lakes for Analytics, Knowledge and Education. Uh, the main idea is that we are putting together uh, a data lake, which would be hopefully one of the world's largest, if not the largest uh, data lake for pathology images, uh, annotated uh, richly uh, for the various kinds of uh, cells and various kinds of important regions. Um, and plus developing AI algorithms for some very specific projects uh, that I can, cannot say very much about at the moment, but also to put it out there for um, ex expanding the, the knowledge uh, in terms of better understanding of cancer and also educating the community and bring in more young guns uh, like the ones that you have on, on this call uh, into the area. And the vision is that uh, we first of all uh, have uh, uh, digitization of uh, uh, the five hospitals that uh, are part of this network. Um, and we are putting together a, a well-curated repository of images with annotations uh, that can drive uh, innovation R&D in AI algorithms for those images. They can then go through uh, validation and regulatory approvals uh, before they can be commercialized and finally adopted in the clinic. So that's our vision. Um, and um, uh, as part of uh, putting together the data lake, we are putting together these reference data sets for various types of cancers for R&D in pathology AI uh, and some specific proof of concept uh, projects for uh, developing AI algorithms, for example, our projects that keeps me and my uh, colleagues in the team busy nowadays. Um, and in the end, we want to demonstrate that this could lead to savings for the national healthcare system in the US um, and also lead to improved uh, patient outcomes. Um, the data lake is going to be uh, strictly uh, governed by the fair principles of data sharing, i.e. the data is going to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, the data lake that we are putting together uh, has several key features uh, that will be uh, uh, adhered to. For instance, the data is going to be de-identified, uh, completely uh, anonymous, uh, no identifiable information for the patients, uh, secure using open standards. Um, and and uh, we're uh, already working with other centers and trialists to ensure interoperability. But perhaps the most important of all is this uh, ability of performing analytics 
within the data lake. So soon enough, hopefully within the next year or so, when you go into the path lake data lake, you can query the various data sets that, are, that we are going to be adding to the data lake uh, that will be based at Warwick. Um, and the data lake is uh, coupled with our analytics engine uh, where you could uh, run your analytics lake without having to download. Uh, and this is really important for, uh, again, for young guns, for people who are really interested, really capable uh, in uh, data science and particularly data science for these type of images, uh, but don't have a huge amount of resources for storage, for analysis. So you could uh, query the data and you could select the data set and you can say, I want to perform my analysis on this data set or a subset of a particular data set within the lake without having to download the data. Um, in the end, what we want to do is we want to uh, present uh, various kinds of statistics in front of the pathologist so that they can get a better handle on the state of the battle that is ongoing between the innate immune system and cancer. Uh, and provide predictive analytics for predicting response to a particular kind of therapy in the course of cancer, uh, coming up with risk scores for progression of cancer so that we can stratify patients into low risk and high risk groups uh, and treat them effectively right from the beginning rather than taking chances. Uh, the E in Path Lake is for Path Lake uh, education. And recently we ran um, master classes on data science for computational pathology at the start of this year um, at the headquarter of the Royal College of Pathologists in London. The next master classes we are planning um, on in January uh, next year. Originally, we were planning uh, to, to hold them in September, but now it's been moved to uh, January next year. Um, one of the questions that I get, get asked quite often is, will AI replace pathologists? And my take on that is, um, you know, just, just point them to this quote of uh, Darwin uh, that it is not the strongest of the species and not the most intelligent that survive. Uh, it is the one that is most adoptable to change. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for listening and thank our funders. And most importantly, uh, our wonderful team uh, that has been uh, instrumental in all the uh, work that we've done so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nasser. That was amazing. Um, we often hear about uh, the exponential growth in uh, AI and uh, in hardware that uh, enables this AI to happen. But, uh, you know, it's fantastic to see the exponential growth in uh, your brilliance as well, right? So in the, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, what you've achieved is uh, no less than what AI has achieved, I think. So, you know, congratulations on that. Uh, that, was, that was superb. Um, uh, obviously, we'll be open to questions and, uh, you know, in the meantime, uh, a question that I have for you, uh, when I was doing my PhD, there was another uh, computer scientist who was working with me and doing his PhD, who decided then to go into uh, cancer, uh, you know, research and, and applications of AI. And he told me once that it took him something like two to three years to just embed himself in the domain. Uh, and as a computer scientist, uh, you obviously had to do the same. Uh, you know, what is that journey like for a computer scientist to get into what is, you know, a very complex domain? Uh, you know, how how did you actually deal with uh, this this whole domain change that you had to do? Yeah. So sometimes my uh, pathologist colleagues joke with me that when I point out something that um, uh, I recognize in in these um, images that uh, I have become half a pathologist already. And, and uh, uh, if I could take on their job and I, uh, I'm absolutely clear that I wouldn't want to do that uh, because I'm only pretending to be a pathologist. Um, but it is um, uh, absolutely fundamental. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, being able to cross the boundaries um, is um, the only way to really make advances in an area that requires um, expertise from uh, not just your strong suit, um, but also, um, you know, from working with people. So I tell uh, students, postdocs who are starting with me um, before even they join that they should be willing to uh, invest themselves in learning the basics of another area and, and at least understand the language, if not be able to completely speak that language, at least you should be able to understand that language.
It's like if you're talking to somebody from another country who speaks a completely different language. Well, if they are talking, um, I don't know, I'm just plucking an example out of thin air. If they're talking in Greek, which I absolutely have no idea about, and I'm talking in, in um, Hindi, Urdu, Punjabi, for example, um, and, and they don't know any of those languages, there's no chance that we can communicate with each other, right? So uh, we have to be willing to cross the boundaries, get out of our comfort zones and be able to at least understand the language, if not speak it. Mm -hmm. Thank, thanks, Nasser. Uh, so there are a couple of questions here. Um, you know, the first question is, what are the features of nuclei that changes off, across different cancer types? And we generalize nuclei segmentation across different cancer types using CNN. That's a, a, a very good question. Um, I'm, I'm really uh, pleased that somebody asked that question because it is one of the things that we are uh, currently exploring uh, as well as other groups, we're not the only ones. Um, the morphology of nuclei, the shape, the texture of uh, uh, the nuclei uh, changes um, as cancer progresses. It gets worse and worse. Uh, they become more and more atypical, which means that their shape is uh, for cancer cells within the same within the vicinity of each other. Their shapes are quite different from each other, and and. This is one of the features that is in fact used in breast cancer grading that um, when cancer uh, becomes higher grade, the nuclear pleomorphism gets higher and higher, i.e. The, the changes in the shape and the appearance of the nuclei gets larger and larger. So um, that is uh, really a hallmark of most cancers. And uh, to your second question about can we develop algorithms that can uh, segment all kinds of nuclei, uh, yes, it's a very active uh, area of research. Um, it, it is um, quite challenging uh, because a lot of times uh, cancer nuclei, uh, especially the uh, early grade cancer, they don't look too different from uh, normal nuclei. So uh, differentiating between those uh, cancer cells and, and normal cells is, is quite a challenge. Uh, also having a, a, you know, kind of, a, a, algorithm that can address um, all the different kinds of uh, uh, cancers and, and uh, recognize nuclei and segment nuclei for all different kinds of cancers is an open question right now. There are some advances recently made. The HowardNet algorithm that I mentioned earlier this year uh, won such a challenge contest that was in fact organized by uh, uh, colleagues in IIT Bombay. Um, which is called the MANUSEC, uh, the, the Multi-Organ Nuclear Segmentation and Classification Challenge Contest, uh, the Hover Net algorithm came on top. Um, but having said that, uh, you know, the, the performance of the algorithm is nowhere near, uh, you know, what we would like it to be. So we're, we're carrying on work on improving the performance of this algorithm and, and expanding it to multiple types of nuclei so that you can have a kind of one-stop shop for um, you know, having a crack at uh, recognizing different kinds of nuclei within different types of cancer images. I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, can you comment on how one can increase the sensitivity of nuclei segmentation in case of a novel cancer type where we have limited training data sets available? Yeah, that's another uh, very good question. Um, every time we uh, get involved in a new project, we are faced with exact same problem. We get new data. We um, say that we've got good algorithm for nuclear segmentation. And then we, uh, you know, apply it on the new data, and then it, it might be a slightly different story. Um, so one of the ways that we are exploring, um, and I'm sure we're not the only ones, is a uh, few short learning. Um, you know, taking in uh, whatever knowledge we've learned from. Uh, the various kinds of data sets and the various kinds of cancers, um, and then uh, expanding that to the limited data set that is available for a new cancer, for a new project, for instance. Um, and I think that has a lot of potential. So uh, watch that space. Mm -hmm. Next question is just sort of curiosity. If lymphocytes are good for humans, then more uh, the TLI counts, it should be better. Uh, generally, as I said, generally that is the case. Lymphocytes are a very specific kind of uh, uh, immune cells. 
which uh, uh, are usually, um, you know, the evidence uh, is that uh, the more you find lymphocytes in the middle of tumor, uh, the better uh, prognosis of the patient. However, uh, it's not as simple as that. Lymphocytes also come in all shapes, sizes, and forms. Uh, there are many subtypes of lymphocytes it's very, very difficult to ascertain from these uh, images that I showed you. So you need to have specific markers to identify those very specific kind of lymphocytes. And, and uh, lots of people working on that, including us, on identifying those very specific kind of lymphocytes and uh, 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 being able to then investigate the role of those specific type of lymphocytes that have infiltrated into cancer. Um, so again, a lot of work going on, and it's a, it's a very, very active area of research. So at the moment, yes, you, you're right that generally, uh, the more the TILs, uh, the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in, in tumor, the better the prognosis. But as I said, it's not as simple as that. There, there are uh, more nuances to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and where you had shown in a slide the survivor curves, right? And you showed that there was a, a big difference uh, based on the amount of lymphocytes that had uh, penetrated the, uh, the nuclei of a cancerous cell. So, I mean, it, was that like a Cox's regression where you were putting uh, an image through as a, uh, almost like the uh, independent variable here that was impacting survival? Or what was, or did you use some kind of a threshold on, on the... Uh, the metric to just split it into two cohorts. So it's the Cox uh, proportional hazard analysis right. um, for drawing these Kaplan Meier curves. Right. Um, and and uh, of course, you have to pick a threshold, a mm -hmm. cutoff. Um, mm -hmm. And for that, we use a, a discovery part of the data set and then uh, use that cutoff for the validation part of the data set uh, without changing that cutoff. OK. And, and the objective here was, uh, you know, then to look at what kind of treatment protocols could be uh, followed as a result of, uh, you know. Exactly. So patient stratification into appropriate risk groups that can uh, help us determine, um, you know, how to treat a given patient. That's extremely important, you know, being able to score um, a, a patient and, and decide on whether they should be put on an aggressive treatment regime or, um, left alone for now or, or maybe uh, treated a bit more mildly, that is extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where I think uh, there, there's a lot of uh, mileage in exploring these type of algorithms. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where a, a lot of research is being done at the moment as well, including our own group. Sure. Um, I am aware of your time restriction. Uh, there are a couple of other questions, but I know you had another call, so I, I'll, I'll hold those back and maybe What's that? What's up them to you uh, for sure. answers on that? Sure, um, our LinkedIn, WhatsApp, LinkedIn, very happy to uh, get into a more detailed discussion if, if that's needed. Sure, and Nasser, thank you so much again. Uh, you know, we don't want to let you go yet, but uh, I guess you we have to. Uh, and I hope that you will take out some time and come back and talk uh, deeper about some of these, uh, uh, you know, great uh, neural architectures that uh, you and your team have put together to solve some of these problems. Um, and of course, the next time I promise, uh, you know, I'd love to hear you deliver this lecture in Punjabi, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I would, I would uh, love to do some of that, uh, at least part of it. It's difficult to do everything. Sure. Uh, but yeah, would would um, would love to see you again, and and uh, uh, always a pleasure uh, talking to you, Sarab, um, and, and your team. Uh, look forward to seeing you soon, hopefully. Absolutely, God willing. Okay, thank you so much, Nasser, and I hope to see you again on, on our webinar series with uh, getting even deeper into some of the aspects that you touched upon today. Pleasure. Thank you, thank okay. you very much. Bye. -bye. Bye.